Well, I'm a new member to be inducted in 2017. In terms of the work that I did, I was nominated for two particular contributions. The first one, which was done in 1986 and 87, was designing how email is routed in the internet. And you say email and routing and that means I worked out the rules by which when you say send on your email to send and send to somebody else, how we decide the email should move through the net to a machine where that other person will receive that email. And the basic idea is everything to the right hand side of the at sign. So, you know, at gmail.com or at, you know, cisco.com or at example.com or, you know, harvard.edu or whatever, how it goes from the machine you're entering your email on to the right mail server for that domain. The two different contributions are very different. One of them has a distinct set of aha moments, and that's the router, and I'll talk about that in a moment. For email, instead, I really stumbled into it. I was simply trying to get the email systems for an NSF-sponsored network working with the domain name system and realized it wasn't going to work. And so, as I said, I stumbled into the problem and was lucky enough that John Postel said, okay, you found it, you fix it. Um, and then was lucky enough to work with a good group of other people who understood email and its needs so that we came up with a solution that's still in use 30 years later, which I find somewhat astonishing. Um, for, and, and that was, you know, mostly a matter of luck and timing and just, you know, accident of fate, if you will, uh, combined with the, a lot of good people to work with. The, the high-speed router was very different. That was a set of aha moments. Um, I had been working for three or four years at that point on projects for the U.S. government research projects related to high-speed networking. And different teams around the country had figured out how to make other networking protocols, higher layer protocols, you know, file sharing, the transmission control protocol work very fast. And so it was clear that the, the big problem was going to be how to make the internet protocol, the thing that's in routers, work very fast. And everybody viewed that as a, hard, a problem they, that they didn't know how to solve. And um, I was lucky enough to, or stupid enough, to think that maybe it was solvable. So I said, okay, let me see if it's solvable. And the aha moment, the first big aha moment was I sat in a talk from a representative from Intel Corporation, and they had a processor called the Intel 960 that they were interested in getting used in networks. And it was very fast. And I looked at the specification for its speed and for its instructions, and I said, how fast could I, if I was really careful and wrote it in assembly language, basically machine language, the raw machine language for the, the processor, how fast could I move internet protocol packets? And I went to my boss, who went to my vice president, and said, would you give Craig a little bit of internal money to see if this is feasible? And the VP said, sure. And I spent about a month sitting there, literally, and we didn't have, you, you couldn't buy the 960 processor in a configuration we needed to test. So instead we wrote I wrote all the code by hand and then sat down with my colleagues and we checked that the code was correct by hand. And then we calculated the instruction timings and we added it all up. And the aha moment was at the end of the month, we added it all up and we had found a way to move over a million packets per second with one processor, which was just so far ahead of what anybody had done up to that point that it was like, Oh boy, and I can still remember just the sitting there looking at that sheet of paper that I'd slaved over for a month with all these instructions and going, it really works. And then we handed actually the vice president as a result, he said, this is the best money I've ever spent on an internal research project. So we knew, knew we had something. At first, I had the, I've had the great benefit of working at BBN Technologies, which has been, you know, it's, it turned on the ARPANET in 1969. It built many of the internet components for the, the internet for the government uh, and ran much of the internet for the, in the 1980s. So the, the, the fact that I was sitting there, it's sort of one of the two or three ground zeros for networking research is, and all the 
brilliant people in the hallways. I mean, you'd have a lunchtime conversation and learn something you hadn't known before routinely, and that's a tremendous benefit. I'm always cautious about the notion of taking explicit action. It always seems that we don't quite know the consequence of our actions. But, but let, me just, let me just talk about, I guess, my biggest fear. I, um, one of the great joys as the internet started spreading in the 90s, one of the things that sort of was a, an aha moment was that we made the world better by increasing openness, right? Um, you know, and the, the thing I remember most was a series of articles in various newspapers and magazines and such about people in rural areas of the United States and to a lesser degree in Europe, because those were the areas of expansion at the time, who found that they were no longer just the weirdo in their town or the oddball person, but that in fact that their view on life or their sexual orientation um, was rather mainstream. It was just that their town was sufficiently small that there was only going to be one of them in town. But if they looked across the other towns in their state or in their region, they would find there were hundreds or thousands of other people like them that they could share experiences with. And that they found this validating, that it, it enabled them, uh, it, it apparently saved a number of them from typical you know, depression, and the most common one, I think, being gay teens, who at the time had no clue that there were other gay teens around. Um, if you were in a small town, if you were a high school class of 10, you were the only one. Um, but there were other communities of that ilk, people who suffered from uh, rare diseases and found suddenly that there were help groups in which people could say, oh no, the reason you're having trouble is your doctor doesn't see this. The, the one specialist in the United States is Dr. So-and-so, and she's practicing in Austin, Texas, or you know, Portland, Oregon, or something, and you suddenly knew where to go. Um, and it made the world a much better place, and you could just tangibly feel the world's a better place. And now we're seeing a backlash in which we're saying, oh, the internet's open, this is a danger. No, it's it, like anything else, it has its good and its bad sides. But I fear that our concern that, you know, th that people who are evil, and I'm, I'm not gonna worry about the people who we disagree with, but the people who are utterly evil, um, have also found ways to use the internet. Um, you know, the, I think child pornography being probably the most obvious and pernicious problem. And we need to find ways to deal with those sorts of things. Um, but to allow people to say it's because of openness of the internet is, I think, completely misguided. And we need to find solutions that target those problems, which, have, let's face it, been society's problems before the internet existed, too. Uh, but we need to find ways to deal with them that don't compromise uh, our ability to serve the far more people who benefit from openness. Um, when I got into the field, pretty much anywhere you looked was an open problem that needed attention. Um, and it didn't take much to find a new problem. Um, the, what was required was skill in solving it. I think now finding real new problems is hard. Um, in part, also, I think people don't recognize that initial work in new problems looks very raw. I mean, our whole research infrastructure, you know, is with peer review, leads people to anytime you write a paper, well, you know, somebody must have worked on this before, so there must be 60 or 100 references, and there must be many things to cite that you haven't. And yet, if you're really doing something new, you're probably only citing four or five papers. You know, you're putting in something in which there's almost no foundation. You have to create the foundation. And, and, and I think that many people don't realize how tough that is and that you need to go really have the courage to go try something really new and ignore all the guidelines about, oh, you need 100 citations for it to be used for. No, you don't. You need a really great idea and you need one that, and, and you need to have the courage to say, I've looked at the literature and there isn't a lot of stuff on this and yet we need to do it. 
how completely unpredictable the applications are. You, you know, we completely and utterly fail almost all the time to predict how people will be using the internet from five years from now. And then equally surprising, despite the fact that we have no clue how it will be used, we turn out to be exceptionally good at predicting um, the demands, how, how much of the internet they'll be using, how much traffic they'll be putting through it, and the demands we'll need to, to, to meet. So that's it's sort of this funny yin yang. We don't know what they'll be doing, but we know roughly how much traffic they'll be demanding of us. It's an interesting paradox. From a technology perspective, I hope that it will get ever more secure. Okay, you won't have to keep worrying about people breaking into websites or breaking into your systems, ransomware, all these sorts of things. Um, I think that's doable. Um, it's hard, it's very hard, um, and unfortunately not enough people are working on it. Um, the, and, and too many people are fascinated by figuring out how to break into your system rather than how to protect it. Um, I think that's, you know, that's the, 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 other, the other one is that I just uh, hope that people always continue to feel the internet's a place that they can trust as a resource. And I think sometimes we have been losing that sense of trust.